Hello, ladies. I'm so happy that you've come and that you're willing to listen to me while you work. I'm creating these videos so that you can listen as you go. You know, I love to have something in the background while I'm doing something at home. And uh, homemaking is sometimes very isolating and repetitive. And we sometimes just need a little bit of help, someone to talk to. I remember when my children were growing up and I was homeschooling them, they would come into the kitchen and read to me while I cleaned up something or did something that they weren't able to do. And uh, I had to get my housework done, so they followed me around and read their lessons or we talked. And that, that always just made the time go so much better and faster and the jobs were um, not as uh, tedious to me. So this is why I'm making these videos and if you're new here there are no comments on YouTube but you can go over to my blog for which I'll provide a link. Please go over there and leave a comment or if the if you don't think that the comments are being taken by blogger you are welcome to go on my email on the left and email me a comment and I'll paste it in for you. And so we usually start out with three, with first, first thing is getting ready, getting prepared and starting with your appearance. Now I know if you're young, it doesn't really matter, does it? You always look good because you're young and you can just kind of slap around in, in your house shoes and your uh, pajamas and get all your housework done. and and it doesn't seem to matter but look I think that it's really important to dress well for the job to dress with dignity and that it makes such a difference and if you can also add an apron one of those pinafore types that that goes over your shoulders this is where you're going to get all the splashes and all the flour and all the dirt from cleaning and somehow when I put that apron on I feel like I have almost like started the car I just feel like I've started and putting that apron on gives me uh, the idea that I'm going to be doing something. I'm going to be accomplishing something. So one of the reasons I start out with appearance is because, you know, people can make you feel like you're being overly concerned about appearance. And I remember when that uh, noise kind of came out. It was in the early 1960s. Now, before that, in the 1950s, when I was growing up, women uh, knew that it was good to look after your hair and look after your skin and look after the you know your the clothing that you wore they were careful about it everything was pressed and ironed. it was very important to have a good presentation and especially if you were if you were not well off and didn't have a lot of money your appearance mattered even more because you wanted to be decent you wanted to at least look like you uh, had a chance at life and that you were that you cared that you had good character it had a lot to do with how you dressed and how you looked because if you would pay attention to your appearance it also meant you would be responsible with other things and so today I think there there might be some kind of intimidation you know if you're a homemaker you're a homeschooler and you are also a Christian that maybe as a woman you have to not be so shallow as to care about things like that. But I have found that there's a big difference in when I dress up for the home and when I decide I don't care. And the day the day I decide I'm not going to dress well or even care is the day uh, there's all kinds of disasters. Everyone's cranky, and so everybody starts coming to the door, and it's like, oh, they want the a little bird told them I wasn't dressed up that day. But uh, dress up anyway, even if you don't think anyone's going to see you, because your children will see you, your family will see you, and they, you are developing your children's taste. You're developing your little boy's taste, and he'll be a young man that will admire a young woman one day who dresses well because you developed that taste in him. You are developing your daughter's taste by uh, the way that you dress and by the way that you uh, the example you're showing by getting dressed first thing in the morning, getting ready for your work, and your children will follow suit and make sure that they get ready. And that's one of the joys of having my children home and being to homeschool them is because they never ran out the door with a piece of toast in their mouth or uh, their jacket half on. We took time, and they took time to get dressed. And one of the things that I did as far as my appearance going is if I was if I had finished my shower or bath whatever and I was getting ready 
and uh, I was all dressed. I opened the bathroom door, and that's when I did my hair, and that's when I, you know, took care of my, checked my appearance, and so the children could see this, and they could see how I did it, and um, so I think it's really important to get dressed. It's just like you're giving yourself a beginning, and if you would get dressed up to go somewhere else, then you can get dressed up for the home, and I think one of the th things that we lack is the ability to see our home as have, as somewhere, somewhere. This is somewhere. And uh, we find it easy to get dressed up and go somewhere else or to look forward to doing something else. But if you look at your home in a totally different way, as if it were going somewhere and you'll dress for it, you're going to feel a lot different about the whole thing. And I think especially uh, homemakers lack support and it is an isolating job. Of course it's isolating. How could you do it in a group? It would be difficult to do it in a group. And so the isolation can, can get to you and you wonder, does it matter? But it will matter to your insides, to your character, to your emotions. You will find yourself feeling more stable as you start to do your work very excellently, as you look in nooks and crannies and corners and drawers and, and start to tidy them all up and make things look nice. Do you know that even uh, when I open a drawer, I like for the drawer to delight me. I like for the way things are arranged to, uh, to greet me as though I am important. And so if I arrange that drawer nicely, that's how it will treat me back. And I know that sounds awfully funny, but I don't want any surprise. I don't want to open a drawer and be discouraged. I don't want to open my refrigerator and be depressed. I don't want to go in my sewing room and look at a mess in there and just feel defeated. So that's why I keep doing it. And I, the more I do it, the more my um, my memory improves. My brain settles down. My um, My thinking gets very logical and normal. And so if you're having trouble with any kind of confusion, any kind of anxiety, I would really suggest strongly take some time to clean up something. And that's why I'm doing these videos. So you'll have something to listen to when you're doing some of this work. Now, as far as preparation goes, I want to show you something. Some of you that have a very low attention span, and you know who I'm talking about, <laughs> You can turn this off in a minute after I show you my teacup. Uh, this is this is from Home Goods. You can also get these at places like um, T at, um, Marshalls and Ross and uh, where we get seconds. You know, they're they're brand new products, but they might have like from last season, or they might have a flaw in them or something. But they're perfectly good, and you can get them at reject stores, things like that. And this is from Gracie's Teaware, Grace's Teaware, and it's dishwasher safe. But I don't I don't put them in the dishwasher because eventually that's going to wear off the the uh, the picture. But I just love it and it's green. You know I always thought green was uh, it has a mood to it. Green color has a mood to it and green feels like energy to me. Green feels almost like stability to me. It's the color of the lawn. It's the color of uh, of healthy uh, of health and of certain vegetables and and fruits. And so I'm doing green today. And I have uh, something else to show you before I get started. Um, so I wanted to show you these cards. Now I've been to the Dollar Tree and. You can get these note cards, and there's eight of them. There are eight of them, so that makes, and for a dollar, so that makes them, uh, well, you know, a little more than 10 cents each, right? So these little cards, what's interesting about them, and they come with the envelopes, this is just real handy. And if you need to catch up on correspondence, I'd highly recommend these. These are from the Dollar Tree, and they're blank. So then if you're worried about the time that it takes to write about something or to send a note, uh, you've only got that much space there to write in. So I'm really, I'm highly recommending these.
for anyone who is busy and just keep them handy. The envelopes are with them and cards are so nice because they come with an envelope. Everything's there. You don't have to go hunt for an envelope. Go hunt for a piece of paper and go hunt for a card. It's all there. And so some of you that are card makers that like to make cards, you know, that's one of the, the nice things about it. Uh, you can have it all handy and you can even stick a your little paper, your little leaf of stamps sitting right inside of it and keep that handy and uh, and always be ready to send a note to someone. And I think these are just the best thing. And they're from the Dollar Tree. Now the other thing that I want to show you is that I got a new book. And I wasn't sure about it, but I've been going through my old books and all my homeschool books and one of the reasons that I still have all that, I had children uh, that loved those books, and they ordered their own. You can get them all. They replaced them all, so they all have their own set of homeschool books, and I still have the old ones. So I'll look at them sometimes, feel kind of sad because I didn't really get time. To, there isn't time, you know, to teach everything. There isn't time to go through everything, but I decided one day I was going to get this book because it was um, in Victorian Trading Company. It's called The Art of Cursive Penmanship. Now, that looks to me like the Palmer Method. It does not look like uh, Copper Plate or Spencerian, but it might be a little of each. So I thought, well, I'd, write, I'd order it. And, of course, in the, in the catalog and on web, it didn't really look this big, but I mean, it's it's pretty hefty book. Look at that. So I thought I'd give myself a course, and I've always been interested in it. And, uh, you know, when you have children, you're busy teaching them, but you're also cleaning up and you're keeping house. You don't really have much time for yourself. So I ordered this, and I felt sad because I hadn't had time to teach them something like this. But it's The Art of Penmanship from Victorian Trading Company, and I quite like it. And so I wanted to show you... They used to take the pen and also make feathers and pictures of birds with the, with their ink and pen. But I wanted to read you something about. I'll show you. I'll show you how they. It's very much like um, the Spencerian penmanship books that we used to get for homeschool, where they have the little lines and slanted lines, so you could write at a perfect slant. And so. I was looking through this. I haven't actually started it, but I thought I would start it for myself. And so I want to read a couple of things to you in it. And if you've got something you need to go do, uh, you can just listen to this. And I'll read a couple of things. They have things in here uh, for, for, for them to copy. And um, so I wanted to read to you about some of the... I don't know, they, they take authors and they will take uh, something from an author here. And I wanted to read something that you could write and they have it all written out here with the slant and everything. The old scrapbook. Twas an old scrapbook in the parlor there where it lay in the amber light. A token of time for past its prime when forgotten hands would write. Just there, on the desk by the briar pipe rest, next to a dry inkwell, where lukewarm dream it said, so it seemed, come closer, I've got stories to tell. <laughs> Just sweet little, little, little things to write. And there was something else in here, I didn't mark it, unfortunately, and I don't want to spend a lot of time just trying to find it uh, for you. But I wanted to read something in here that it says about handwriting that that is so true. And it says here, speed kills. Isn't that interesting? Speed kills, slow down. And you know, and even in homemaking, even with your housework, if you're in a hurry, even with children hurrying them, or uh, if you make them in a hurry, often causes trouble because it causes accidents even at home when you're hurrying. And so that's why I say when you're doing your home homemaking and your homework to, uh, to slow down and enjoy the moment, enjoy every movement, 
and to slow down and don't let the world pressure you into hurrying. And it doesn't mean that you have become negligent, but I mean, you can, if you allow yourself plenty of time, you can get things done and if you can move a little bit more slowly, you'll have less accidents and uh, it'll be cheaper. <laughs> it'll be cheaper if you don't have to throw things away. And uh, so speed kills, this is about handwriting, but it can apply to a lot of other things. Slow down. Writing too quickly is the biggest reason why most handwriting has deteriorated into a scrawl. In olden days, people often took great pride in their name and took the time to write it well. Handwriting, penmanship, is a physical skill inv involving thought, dexterity, and muscular movement. You are not a machine. Your name should be important to you and also to the context of what you write. Allow yourself the time it takes for your hand to form the letters legibly. Even with your busy schedule, you should have a few extra seconds of time to do this. By slowing down, not only your signature, but all of your handwriting will improve. Now this is really important because one of the things, I always loved handwriting from the time I was real little and we, I could hardly wait to learn. We always had to learn to print first and then, and then they would allow us to write. Uh, but I always was interested in it and I did very well because it's actually, it's just copy work, it's art. You learn to imitate and you're, you're drawing and you're drawing these letters and you're imitating. And I, uh, I did pretty well, and I even got some, um, you know, prizes and awards in handwriting class for my for my handwriting. And then something happened, and that was around seventh grade. I went to public school, and see, I, I took all this stuff in, and I had a little bit of resentment about all of it. I always remembered it, and that's part of what formed my opinion about homeschooling, because I re recalled some of the the fallacies of my own education and I wanted I didn't want my children to have some of these things happen so um, I got into seventh grade and the teacher wanted us to go home and listen to a news broadcast we didn't have television yet in our family and he wanted us to listen on the radio to the evening news and he wanted us to take notes and everybody in that class got worse handwriting because we were busy taking notes and uh, because we were hurrying. And after that, it was just rush, rush, rush. And then also to get assignments done, we didn't uh, take our time handwriting. And a lot of the assignments were essays and we had to write them and uh, we wanted to get, you know, our assignments done on time and often, uh, assignments were only a day away and so we would write rather fast and that's the hurrying is what caused my handwriting to deteriorate and I'm still trying to you know I'm still trying to correct that I've always wanted to write well and haven't been able to do it um, but I would like to would like to read one more thing to you here if I could find it because they had some they had some pretty good uh, samples of handwriting and it was called handwriting samples well I can't find out I must have been reading a different totally different book <laughs> okay here's one I can read called the master's pen and they, this is for the student to write. It happened somewhere in the distance, so long ago in the past, the times that were set when the great penmen met to see who could write well and fast. They met at the penmen's convention. The thrill was to see who'd be there. And wagers were placed to see which master's face would be among those in each other's chair. Some, of course, were expected the leaders, the legends of fame, known well and by all, as they walk down the hall by their fondly remembered nickname. There goes the dean of engro engrossing. See the pen wizard standing nearby. The voices would ring. It's the flourishing king, as he, as he winked 
a monocled eye. <laughs> and uh, that was just written so because it had certain letters that had to be done. Um, a bit silly if you ask me. And there are some here from the Bible. So, uh, okay, here's, here's what I wanted to read to you. Now, I remember growing up that um, school was not always completely secular, and so they weren't embarrassed by having, you know, Bible things or uh, things that alluded to biblical things in their two handwrite. So I did find it here, so I will read it to you. One day at a time. Now, this is great for homemakers. So I've spoken for 20 minutes. If you need to go somewhere else, you can turn it off and you can just take it up another time. But this is called One Day at a Time. This is great for homemakers. Finish every day and be done with it. You have done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities, no doubt, crept in. Uh, I'll make a comment on that later. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. Begin it well and serenely, and with too high a spirit to be cr uh, cumbered with your old nonsense. This day is all that is good and fair. It is too dear with its hopes and invitations to waste a moment on all the yesterdays that have come before. Now, isn't that the truth? Um, we're all... You can't start. Here's a mistake that I used to make when I was really, really young, like eight years old. Is I'd start a day thinking, oh, it's wonderful. I don't want to make any mistakes today. And I couldn't cope with it if there was a mistake made. If I, uh, if I, if I failed at something or things didn't just go quite right for me, I'd burst into tears. And I think a lot of eight-year-old girl, girls feel that way. We, we really want to have a serene day, even if we're eight or, or older, and we can't cope with it. But I like that that little poem said, no doubt some absurd, absurdities and nonsense has crept in. And so you have to expect a certain amount of it. Not everything will go well. But uh, you have to look at it as life is part good and part bad. There will be a bit of each in your day. And uh, you have to just forgive everybody and move on. So I did uh, try to tell you that God created you. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's important to dress up. Uh, because you're unique and you need to... It's a, it's a way of giving thanks to God for, for what He's uh, created in you for your life. Thank him for making you, and you can do this with your appearance. So this is one thing, one reason to to dress well for the home. And it's a way to pay attention to yourself. It's a way to spend a few minutes looking in your own eyes in the mirror to see that that you have a good attitude, that you haven't hardened your, that you're not hardened, and that that you're. Um, that you're happy and it's a way to check yourself so that's really really important and so let's focus uh, and you can focus on your expression and you can take uh, take care of yourself take care of your hair and pay attention to yourself and um, think a few minutes about your life at home and also I was gonna when we talk about our life at home and I wanted to remind you I'm not going to show you anything else so you can go ahead do some work while you listen but it's not easy is it to focus on your life at home because there's always the media that I don't care if you just were looking in your mail something's gonna come in the mail that's alarming that's trying to tell you you know you need to do something about this alarming thing that's that's happening and so you can get some people take it in more other people kind of buffer it just don't doesn't seem to bother them um, but you need to focus on your home. And uh, the, we realize the world has always been in turmoil. Always been in turmoil. And I could take you through the stories of artists of the 18th century and 19th century who painted beautifully in spite of wars going on, diseases, um, tragedies, um, low, um, like the economy of their country just downhill. And yet they painted beautifully. And 
some of my favorites I've put on my blog over the years. I'll try to put more of those on again to some of you who are new here because these people went ahead and painted beautiful paintings. You cannot paint a beautiful painting if you're worried about the world, if if you're worried about whether things are are going to be there tomorrow. You know, if you're going to be that tomorrow, you have to ignore all that. Well, it's like that for the home because you've got these little children. There's not a second chance at them. There's not a second chance to make them uh, have a happy home life. And I really believe that children should be brought up with a happy, carefree childhood, free from worry and heavy responsibility. So you don't need to be uh, frightening them with problems that they don't need and let them enjoy being a child as long as they will be a child it's very important to have that childhood and if the mother is at home they're going to have a better childhood because she can provide this for them now as far as housekeeping goes you can involve the children in your housekeeping if they see it as something to look forward to and i think one of the things that you can do if you see that you want uh, your children to be more interested in life and happier and better have more stability and just be um, more the the type of uh, I always think of an old-fashioned boy and girl they're just happy with life happy with everything and uh, of course there will be nonsense now and then is to take and you're having trouble maybe getting started in your homemaking today and you have children uh, I'll just talk to you about that if you have a coffee table, I would suggest getting an oval or a round coffee table with no edges on them, no no points, no places for them to hurt themselves. So just get a round or oval coffee table if you have one, and or any other type of end table, everything. You can always, if you're worried about the edges of those tables being so smart, you can always put blankets on them, and uh, it'll soften those edges and so that when children pull themselves up or they get near them, they don't hurt themselves. But... I would put, when mine were little, on the coffee table, I'd arrange it with their books and their toys. And then we would have a new scene every now and then. And they loved it. And this became their home. This is part of their life and their home. It doesn't just belong to you, but it's an investment for them, too, and they're part of it. And this is partly their place. And uh, so that's what I would do. I'd put a, a doll, teddy bear, a truck, and a pile of books on there that belong to them and make it their home. Arrange it with some of their things, too. This is just something that you might want to do, maybe not. The other thing I would suggest about homekeeping is to use your interests and talents as much as you can in this. Use it as an opportunity to express your uh, tastes and yourself or discover your own uh, likes and dislikes through this. For instance, you might get your uh, your couch all cleaned up and the pillows poofed and stand back and look at it and think, you know, that just needs some, some different color and go to another room and get another cushion and put on it. Just this creative feeling that you have. And that life at home is you're creating a com the comforts of home. You're not just keeping house. You're not a housekeeper that came in and has no feeling for it. This is why you do it and not somebody else. And this is why your children tag along with you. I used to take my children into every room that I was in so that I could look after them. Because there's nothing worse than being off in a bedroom, making a bed and cleaning up some things, and they hear a, a scream in another room. So they always tagged along with me. I took them with me so they could see what I was doing or sit in a little chair with some of their things and do something while I was doing my work so use your interest and talents as much as you can and so cleaning house cooking even the laundry can be creative and when you do it to uh, to look good and you feel the joy in it you have a whole different atmosphere in the home and, and a purpose in your home keeping you can develop more purpose um, and I think the children love it at home more, too, if the mother is happy with what she's doing. So you have to work on that. Now, I also want to speak a little bit about cooking. I was cooking the other day. We had a craving for cinnamon rolls. And 
always makes me upset. If I have caught my husband out of eating a cinnamon roll from a grocery store or somewhere else, and I always accuse him of, uh, of uh, food disloyalty, <laughs> and it really upsets me. So I try not to uh, make it convenient for him to do that by, and so I make make cinnamon rolls. If he expresses a desire for them, I'll just make them because I don't want him to eat eat them somewhere else. And that way I know that it's only got three or four ingredients in it and they're good, wholesome things and there's not a lot of additives or fake ingredients. So I made a cinnamon rolls the other day and then I realized that every batch of cinnamon rolls that I have, and by the way, they won't make you fat. If you'll make them at home, make them only once in a while and uh, eat them in the morning <laughs> and also I think that it's a lot of the additives in food that help uh, that prevent people from keeping their their weight normal uh, but the home the home ingredients if they're really good wholesome ingredients shouldn't make you gain weight unless you eat too much but uh, I was thinking the other day when I made these cinnamon rolls that uh, it did very a lot of various things for me, it kind of slowed me down, and I was enjoying it. And then the smell while it was cooking, I was really enjoyed that, and and it also prepares your uh, your sense of smell and your sense of taste, and and you start drooling, and 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 the digestive system starts while it's cooking. You know, it just makes a big difference in uh, how you function if you make your own things. I was thinking how every batch of cinnamon rolls that I have ever made have been different. The texture is a little different. The taste is a little different. And this is because cooking, if people would only realize that it's not going to be the same all the time. I mean, basically, maybe the same, but there's a little slight difference in, in everything. They'll rise a little different each time. They'll, they'll be, because this is why cooking will vary. It's not always exact. It's because it, different seasons, different temperatures in the air outside, a different moisture level, different uh, elevation in where you live. You might live at a different elevation than I do. I live at sea level. And things uh, cook differently and taste differently. And it will also vary according to what kind of flour you're using and where you got it, where your ingredients came from, um, what, what the quality is of everything that you use, you know. So I, uh, I just wanted to tell you that so that you wouldn't be discouraged when you cook if it, is, um, if it doesn't turn out the same each time. And if a recipe apparently doesn't work, it might work at another time. And so I wanted to just mention that about cooking uh, so that you don't, so that you're not discouraged. And what uh, you do with a cookbook is there might be one or two recipes in that book that you just love, but the others not so much. And I've heard of people who will photograph those recipes and put them in a, in a, in a scrapbook or notebook or, you know, with the plastic pages and just use the ones that they like. I, however, enjoy the book. I like the pretty cover and I like the pictures and I like the other recipes, even if I don't use them all. So I have a library of cookbooks and I'll go and get one or two out and go through them. And I know a lady who doesn't ever uh, cook from all those books. She has her favorite things that she always relies on, but she likes to, when she's relaxing, She's sitting back in her favorite chair, and uh, she'll get a cup of tea, and that will be what she will read. She'll read a cookbook like it's a book, a novel, and some people just like to do that. And so cookbooks are entertaining. It's okay to have them. And so now I want to uh, mention that if you get a recipe that you like, then sometimes you can tweak it to suit you. You don't have to follow it exactly. Once you learn about how it works, you can tweak it to serve your family and you and what they like. For instance, I make the cinnamon rolls with just the cinnamon and I don't put the raisins in. A lot of people want the raisins in it. I don't care for them, but I just do what I want to do. 
And so that is the one of the fun things about being at home is you can make things the way you want it and it can taste the way that and you can also develop your own um, unique food just by the way you've cooked it and what your family prefers that can never be imitated anywhere else. Now I've spoken for about 35 minutes. If you have something to do, I hope that you will go on and do it. There isn't anything here to see. I will read to you a little bit more. I'm sorry I don't have an Allison story tonight. I did write one, but I didn't remember to bring it over here. I don't want to go get it. But um, I do send these stories to my grandchildren, and I change them slightly when I'm reading them to you because I don't want uh, to spoil the uniqueness of them. <laughs> so I will try to have one ready for you next time. Now, if you're having a problem getting stuck in your home making and uh, getting started, then I would suggest you start with your kitchen, and that's one of the things that the um, homemaker coach fly lady suggests is go to your kitchen first. Once you get that cleaned up, it seems easier to go on to the rest of the house. Now, years ago, we used to save the kitchen to last because we felt like we would get stuck in there. Once you've cleaned it, and it's just tempting to start making something to eat in there and start cooking. But uh, this unique way is wonderful, and I have found that it works to clean your kitchen first. Make sure everything in there is clean, and then it's just a lot easier. It's not so burdensome. And it's a lot easier to go around to the rest of the house, pick up the clutter, and straighten things out. And if you're feeling a little bit, um, hmm, can't just seem to get started, maybe you're, you're a bit down, and I would suggest that you clean off your coffee table. Just clean off your coffee table. Put something on it, you know, put in a little arrangement. You know, you've heard of these tablescapes. Well, you just take things that you have, things that you like, and you make a little arrangement on your coffee table. And it can... It can cheer you up so much, and then the next morning, when you get up, you see that coffee table and how nice it looks. You're happy. So I think it's really important to feed yourself, feed your mind by cleaning and taking care of things and being creative and even decorating. Now, I know some people don't really approve of uh, decorating, but I discovered that if this is one of the reasons that I got into decorating, because I always ended up in a uh, uh, the manse, you know, the preacher's home or whatever you call it, the parsonage, and it was never up to date, and it was always had uh, things wrong with it, and it was never a really nice new place. But I discovered that if I learned to do florals or I learned to arrange things and I learned to have pretty things around that no one actually noticed the state of the walls or the state of the floor or the worn out old carpet because their eyes would be distracted by by you know uh, a candle holder on the wall or a shelf with a with a pretty arrangement on it so this is how why I got into it and maybe you don't need to do that I feel that I need to but that helps my housekeeping it just motivates me to know that you know after I've swept the floor I'm going to do something nice around the house after I've done the harder work. So it's just kind of like a little bonus afterwards. So now, since I have spoken for nearly half an hour, I'm going to go on to um, read you something out of this wonderful, uh, this book just turned out to be so big. It's very well bound, I have to tell you, but it also has spiral in the middle. I just find it fascinating. But this was a, an exercise in handwriting, and I thought it would be helpful for the homemaker. And so if you're still cleaning, you know, it's something you can listen to while you're cleaning. And it's called Make Big Plans. Now, some of these were written way back, you know, in the olden days. And everybody knew at the time that it, people would have to have um, goals towards which to work. And you have to have goals. You have to have dreams. Even if you never reach them, that's what hope is. It's having um, an idea of something better to come. And even if it never comes, you have to have it because it keeps your heart alive, keeps your mind alive. There's something better. And you want to, you want to go on to something better. Make big plans is what this is called. And it's a handwriting exercise. You have to write this. 
make no little plans. They have no magic in, to stir the soul. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work. Remembering that a noble logical diagram once recorded will never, never die, and that long after we are gone, it will remain a living thing for generations. Well, that had a special meaning for the people. I don't quite understand it all, but I'm sure that they did at the time. And so I thought I'd read that to you because um, I remember the handwriting lessons we had. They all you had to write things that were uh, that had meaning uh, in them. So I thought you might like to I haven't had time to read all this. So. So now I want to go on to uh, people and emotions and the thing that you always fast forward to try to find here. Uh, because when you're home and you are a homemaker, you're on your own and you are self-employed. Uh, so you decide what your schedule will be. And you also want to make your home a, a happy place for your husband and children. And so you decide when you're going to do the laundry and you decide when you're going to show hospitality and have people over. And there are people in the world that will see that you have all this freedom, that you can go to the grocery store in the morning instead of waiting till rushing there after work. And some of you that are retiring are finding that it takes a while you, at first, when you're home and you don't have to get up and go somewhere else, that you kind of walk around in circles thinking, okay, where do I start? What do I do? And so that was that's part of the purpose of these videos is to get you started. Start with your appearance and then go into your kitchen and clean that. And then sit down and make a list of all the things you would like to do, all the things you have to do, and do something that you have to do and something that you like to do every day. And so, because it can't, homemaking can't all be cleaning. It cannot all be work. It also has to have some meaning beyond that, some leisure time. And in the olden days, women had their favorite type of handwork, whether it was needlework or knitting or even painting. There was always some kind of craft they did because they knew that they needed this creative part. Um, because it relaxes the mind and because it also renews the mind. And so this is really important, I think, because it cannot be one long, grueling day of hard work all the time. And that's why I suggest you sit down and have tea time, a cup of tea. It gives you time to gather your thoughts and to think and about what your goals are for that day, for that week. And for that month and to think into the future think beyond the day think of to the future also I think it's really impro uh, important to develop uh, an interest in self-improvement try to do a little better maybe uh, learn conversation learn to do better in conversation learn to do better in um, managing your time uh, and learn to do better with your moods so I want to move into that here emotions I I discovered that you could use emotions such as apprehensive apprehension or um, the feeling of uh, high alertness um, and any kind of feelings that you have that you can't quite you can't quite um, figure out what to do and, and you just you you're always you feel kind of apprehensive you, you can use these put these emotions to good use because they're energy so you can use them uh, turn them into uh, energy for the home so let's say maybe someone has criticized you uh, and and you tend to take that inward uh, you can just say well I'm gonna go clean and sink or I'm going to go, huh, I think I'll put a new curtain up there. I'm just going to sew a new curtain. Now, I enjoy sewing, and I'm just now trying to get my house in order enough so I have a little more time for sewing. And so disappointments, too. Maybe you have done something and failed at it, but you can use that energy, 
the energy that you use in feeling disappointed and having wasted all that time, use that to uh, as a springboard to do something else more positive. So you can take uh, emotions such as apprehension or a feeling of being on high alert for some reason. Something's maybe bothering you. You can use that uh, to turn it into something good for the home. Now, I wanted to talk to you about people a little bit because homemakers tend to, I don't know what it is, but they tend to bear the brunt of criticism. And I, I learned early in life to avoid complaining, criticizing, or condemning. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not discerning or that we tolerate things that aren't good for us or for our family, but to avoid developing that personality of being complaining, criticizing, and condemning. And I realize in some countries that's just a national pastime, and they don't know they're doing it. Uh, but when they come and visit, they feel so different because we always try to be on the upside. Not, It's not insincere. But we find it useful for us to, to live on the upside, not complaining, criticizing, or condemning, but fixing. Fixing and getting things done and moving forward. We use our energy for that instead of complaining, criticizing, and condemning. We'll use that energy to move forward, to fix things, to make progress in life. And uh, that's the reason that I was able to write a little story for my grandchildren is because I'm using the, my energy for that. And any time you spend complaining, criticizing, and condemning is you've sucked something out of your mind and sucked something out of your body that, that is energy that could have been used for something more positive. It might be hard for you to understand that, but that's what I have discovered. And I'm getting far more done, far, uh, far more, more um, progress and in life and things that I have. Now I have goals just like everybody else and there are things I'd like to do. I'd like to lose some weight. I'd like to be have more strength in my arms and I'd like to get my garden cleaned out and I'd like to do this handwriting book and um, educate myself. I'd like to homeschool myself. You know if you aren't homeschooling and you're thinking about it but you're not sure, order yourself a book. Uh, for homeschooling from uh, some kind of homeschool company or yourself a book on something that might interest you and homeschool yourself. Read the book and fill in everything and enjoy it. And one of my favorite books for homeschooling was the Old World History and Geography by A. Becca. Now some of it uh, was were things, there were some things in it that I uh, was not sure about and uh, you have to realize these are not, this is not the Bible, but uh, it, in general, it's a positive experience. It's a positive book, and it shows the purpose of history. And so, or a handwriting book, or something you would like, or an art book, but order something and homeschool yourself and see how you like it and see why you think, why the rest of us think it was an absolute delight. So one thing I want to say about people is, for some reason, homemakers get more people criticizing them or complaining about something. Or rather, it's because you're home and they think they can do it. If you were at uh, in a workplace, uh, nobody would bother you because you have a uh, an employee employer over you or you have uh, some kind of company that you're responsible to everything but you're if you're at home they don't think that anyone's bossing you and they have to boss you <laughs> so you have to be careful but there's also another type of person you have to be careful about and that's anyone who is overly exuberant about you they really like you they're excited about you they want to be friends with you they want to include you in their social circle but anyone who's overly excited is also someone who will crash real fast and pretty soon they're through with you. They're through with you as about as fast as, as they embraced you. So be careful of that. Just look at that. I, I don't get real excited about anything. I am just medium, try to be stable about everything. And one time I um, 
invited some people over and it was an old friend, a friend that's been my friend for a long, 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 long time. And uh, she is very talented and, and I just kind of take it in stride. I'm used to her. We're used to each other and we don't make overly big deal over each other. We're just friends. And so someone, after this person left, someone else that was there said, I'm surprised. Why weren't you more excited about this person, you know? Well, we don't really get excited about people. Uh, we get, we are more impressed with what God is doing in our lives. And we don't actually overly praise each other. And so this person was shocked that I didn't overly praise this person. So you have to be careful about that because uh, also things that people are real excited about, often... Um, my husband always says, whatever starts with a bang, ends with a bang. You get all excited, and they're going to do this, and they, uh, and then they crash. So be very, very careful about that. People who think that you are so terrific will often be very quick to find fault with you, too. So just, just be cautious about things like that. And um, so I wanted to uh, also... While I still have time here, and to warn you also of one other thing, you know, there will always be wars, there will always be uh, disease, there will always be tragedies, there will always be um, maybe uh, the economy crashes or something like that, but the Bible warns us not to live as uh, like those who have no hope. And so if you get older like I am, you start to realize, oh, this has gone on forever. There's always a war. There's always a rumor of war. There's always a disease. And like I call it the disease of the month. There's always a um, economic disaster or a crash. And I always, uh, always notice that it never comes to anything. And of course, living on the, living on the, lower end, uh, we don't live on the high end, we live on the lower end of the income situation, it always stays the same. And uh, you, you get so used to it that you just shrug after a while. And you realize when your children are young, you'll be uh, very glad that you didn't overly react to any of this that goes on constantly. You don't overreact to it because these children have a childhood, and you don't want to look back and say, I spent 10 years or 20 years of my children's life being upset about life, being upset about the news, being upset about who is president, being upset about who, uh, what the current disease was and what the uh, current state of the, uh, of, of the world was. You want to not do that because you, you will waste their youth in your anxiety. You don't want to be doing that. You can look back. Many of us have, you know, I can remember, I didn't even have, we didn't even have television when I was homeschooling my children and I knew what the news was and it bothered me. It upset me. Sometimes I couldn't uh, even eat because it, it was so upsetting, but you don't, when you look back and nothing came of it, you're pretty ashamed of yourself. And so don't live as though, uh, don't live like those who have no hope, okay? And um, then your role at home is more important than the role of any famous person. Just because you're not a uh, published author or a famous, well-known person or someone who has achieved great things and made a discovery does not mean you are less important than they are as a homemaker, as a mother, as uh, even if you are alone right now, uh, having lived your life, and maybe you uh, maybe you now are older and you live a lot of your days alone, it does not mean that you are less important than any of these people that have made great discoveries. You are more important, and you factor largely in the eyes of your and the hearts of your family than anyone else, and you're the only one. You know, most people who've had uh, problems or tragedies in their lives will say that the hardest thing for them was to lose their mother or lose their father. So you realize 
how important you are to your family. And um, so you are famous and important to your family. And you factor more strongly in their hearts than anyone. And I always remember um, there was a woman that came to see me many years ago, and she was uh, telling me, she was a friend of my mother's, and she had dropped by, and she was telling me how she was, it was back in the 60s, and she said she was astonished at all these women that were telling her about all their uh, education and their accomplishments and in the world. And uh, she said she got tired of it one day, and she said, yes, but dear, can you make bread? <laughs> because bread makes people so happy, especially fresh, freshly baked homemade bread. Um, you'll be remembered for the bread you made. <laughs> And uh, I always laughed when she said that because she was also a highly educated woman who'd had a career, but she didn't have any faith in it at all. And she said, uh, you'll do better if you can bake bread. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. So focus on your own family and you won't be bored if you do it well, if you're creative in it, and if you add beauty. And if you dress your best, dress your children your best. And also, it occurred to me, the reason we used to use tablecloths in the old days, on our, people don't use them as much anymore, and they're hard to find in stores. Walmart has a few of them. But tablecloths were there for several reasons. One was they gave a nice clean surface for to lay the plate on and everything. Food was... You know, they knew a lot about sanitation in those days, even though they weren't scientists. But uh, you'd have a fresh tablecloth every day, and uh, you would lay your clean plates on it. And food, anything that had to do with food, was kept extremely, everything was sanitary, everything was clean. And it was also a way to cut down on the noise, the noise of the utensils, the noise of everything um, if you had a pad underneath the tablecloth it was a noise barrier but the other thing was if something tipped over it didn't break because it had the softness uh, so I started using tablecloths after I had broken a few glasses just because they for some reason tipped or I knocked them over they break on that hard wood so I put a pad underneath my tablecloth it was felt, just a piece of felt, and put the tablecloth over it, and I haven't had any problems since, and that's why I use a tablecloth. So that adds something pretty to my home, too, because I, I have a green gingham one on right now, and I layer my tablecloths. That's my padding. I have the other tablecloths under it. I have my spring, my autumn, my winter tablecloths under the one I'm currently using because I don't have a place to store them and then I don't ever have to iron them they're just all nicely pressed right like that so ladies if you um, want to if you don't want to be bored then focus on your own family and your own house and make it your career make it uh, do it do it approach it intellectually learn about it I mentioned the book home comfort comforts by Cheryl Mendelson that you could order, you know, at Thrift Books or somewhere. And it, uh, she very intelligently shows things like why you should try to use cotton sheets to sleep sleep in and just different things about the home, you know, how to wash dishes and just puts a, shows how to make it comfort, a comfort for home. And so if you can, you can approach it intellectually, approach it prayerfully, do it well, be creative and add beauty. Dress yourself and your children well. Have your husband's shirts ironed. You know, I, my husband has got to wear, Mr. S, he's been a preacher for over 50 years, but he stopped wearing a tie. And I still, and he loves he loves the flannel plaid shirts. Of course, we live out in the country, and we're, we work with a little country congregation, and all those men wear plaid plaid shirts. In fact, at the Lord's table on Sunday morning when they're serving communion, the three men that get up, one of them is the um, the person that does the 
the talking and explaining, and the other two pass the take the trays around of the Lord's Supper, and they're all in plaid shirts. <laughs> and Mr. S wears plaid shirts now, and so I press it, I iron it. It has a crease in the sleeve and the on the shoulders, and and it looks well pressed. And I press his slacks, and they have a crease down the middle, <laughs> and so. Everybody's well dressed still because I iron. And so dress yourself well and use your emotions for um, energy and uh, keep your house well and try to be happy at the end of the day. Walk around, look at everything, go back and a tour through your house, look at your work, see that it's well done, and be happy. And uh, remember that it's God that enables you. So ladies, if you've enjoyed this and it has been helpful to you and you've gotten, gotten something done, would you please leave a comment on my blog? Uh, because I'm making these videos for my blog and it will be embedded on my blog. Could you please leave a comment for me and tell me what you've done? You don't have to get too personal, but um, leave a comment because it gives other people who've just started in homemaking or have come home from, uh, retired from, um, working in the workplace uh, idea what can be done and I've spoken for an hour I'd like to know what you got done for an hour I figured it's it's enough to get the dishes or the kitchen and a couple of other things done so please let me know at what you've done and thank you for your love thank you for your prayers and I'll see you next time bye